Oh, and uh, welcome to my talk today as part of the Bradley Tabletop Game Symposium. Um, and my talk is titled Playing the Game World You're Dealt. It is a research project that I undertook while I was studying my master's in games at the IT University of Copenhagen. Um, so I'll try and get right into it. Uh, this is the, the, the map of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll try and get in as many card puns as possible. Um, so I'm going to start off with just a very brief history of cards, probably things that you've you've heard before, maybe maybe some interesting uh, little nuggets that'll be useful for a table quiz in the future. Um, then I try to deconstruct what a card is, try to break it down from you know just a card being a card, try to make it a lot more complicated than that. Um, then I discuss about how I feel cards evoke worlds in tabletop games. And I try to present a new way to talk about cards in games in the future. I'm going to use some examples as well at the end to sort of help get across um, my point of view on the subject. So just to introduce myself, um, my name is John O'Donnell. I am an Irish game designer currently living in Copenhagen. Um, I wrote my master's thesis on board game field when I was studying um, at the MSc games program at the ITU of Copenhagen. Um, and my motivation really um, in my sort of independent research that I'm doing at the minute is to try and help board game studies catch up with video game studies. We were exposed to a lot of academia on video games, and uh, it seems mad that video games have not been around for that long, but there's just so much written about them, whereas board games and tabletop games have been around for an awful lot longer, but they just have some catching up to do. So these presentations like this today are my attempt to sort of help board games catch up. I hope you find it interesting. So um, first of all, uh, we'd just like to, you know, the elephant in the room, we all agree that cards have been around for a long time. In fact, we've been playing with cards since we've been able to print them. Um, humans have played card games since at least as early as we've been able to print paper. There's accounts referring to Yezi Z or the Leaf game being played during the Tang Dynasty, which is around 800, 900, um, uh, the year 800, 900, um, which coincided with the development of woodblock printing. Um, these cards were described as being rectangular, about an inch wide, two inches high, several inches, several tenths of a finger thick. Um, they supposedly represented fictional persons from the Chinese novel Water Margins, but also bore similarities to the recently developed paper money. And so they've tried to reconstruct the rules as they've tried to do with many ancient board games, but it's unclear today whether the uh, represent representations on these cards were for a game that was closer to role playing or was it closer to resource management or gambling. At the minute, we, we don't know. But there's other old card games that we're also familiar with. Um, we have the standard 52 card deck. Um, we would say that the most certain ancestor to that 52 card deck arrived in Europe um, about 50 years before the tarot deck in the 14th century. We might assume that the tarot deck was the, the Ur deck of cards, but um, there actually were decks of cards before that. It's thought to have been inspired, transmitted by way of Eastern trade routes in Venice. That's because um, when it appeared in the European scene, it was very fully developed and had striking similarities um, as regards the suits and imagery compared to Chinese, Mamluk, and Egyptian playing card decks. While the connection is not certain, playing cards may be the first sample of Chinese printing techniques moving from east to west. This is contrary to several accounts of the Italian deck being a simplified form of the tarot. Uh, that exact pedigree is a little bit difficult to trace, um, but the ubiquity of both the tarot and standard deck in Europe post-1400 is undisputed. We can see a, certain, a sort of a universal appeal in the symbolism of the tarot deck in the tradition of game playing, divination, and storytelling. The depth of resources on using the tarot in all of these different ways abundantly establishes the communicative powers of tarot as an institution. The cards tell a story, not only through their imagery, but also through their orientation, their order that they come out in, and the relationships with each other. We might think of the meaning formally being constructed through one of many layered associations, associational structures, as well as the reader's active association with that structure. The tradition is reinterpreted with many different rituals and imagery as oracle decks. These are kind of like tarot decks, but, but you know, for different purposes. 
a seemingly free expression version of the tarot with different conventions for card design, rules, and syntax. The tarot's power to procedurally generate narratives that feel singular and personal should be lauded and illustrates the interpretive power of the medium. Um, and then modern uh, cards in the modern tabletop setup, um, you know, we can find them in uh, every genre of game. We might delineate modern tabletop games into role-playing games, Euro games, American games, um, uh, war games, collectible card games. But you don't have to dig too far to discover cards being an integral part of games in every genre. If we take the Spiel des Jahres as a, a sample, albeit a, a bit of a biased uh, sample when we're thinking about all tabletop games, but if we think of it as a sample of the creme de la creme of modern board games, 55% uh, of the winning games um, of the Spiel des Jahres include cards in some shape or form, indicating that there are potentially card innovations to be found in every second board game. So um, I realize I might be coming across as a sort of kicking a dead horse here. <laughs> uh, yeah, John, we know cards are everywhere, but um, I'm just trying to reinforce that uh, cards are very, very important in human culture. Um, yeah, so um, reading modern um, uh, thought leadership on game design, we can see the cards are sort of generally applicable to, to all parts of design. Um, I've seen some quotes in board design, design advice saying that the card is the fundamental unit of prototyping. and It's pivotal to most designs. Um, attempts to distinguish board games from card games kind of become murky uh, straight away. Um, this, is because the per this is because of the pervasiveness of cards and tabletop games. Um, and to sort of go any further would uh, uh, is, is a little bit redundant. We know that cards are an important part of modern tabletop games. Um, they're so important to modern games in general that uh, we also see them in digital games. But I would posit that the cards in digital games are, are not really cards. They are representations of cards. So the aesthetics and the procedures, things that we can do with digital cards, um, are very, very different to the things that we can do and, and see on non-digital cards. If we take Hearthstone as an example, which is pictured here, um, the cards can speak, they can animate, and they can emit different particle effects. So uh, they also can move at their own accor accord. <laughs> a card. They can move at their own accord. They can generate new cards. Um, and they can access properties of face down cards without looking at them. So they can you know, read properties from your deck without actually going in and, and looking at your deck, which you'd have to do in, in non-digital games. Um, I think Magic Arena then, uh, which is the Magic the Gathering counterpart of Hearthstone, um, that is arguably more similar to a card game because the rules and procedures in Magic Arena are the same as, as what you can do in the non-digital version, in regular Magic the Gathering. But the added audiovisuals, so the, the sounds, the animations, and different effects, um, they provide lots of affordances for communicating game worlds that the non-digital Magic the Gathering, normal Magic the Gathering, they can't emulate. So for the purposes of this argument, I'm only focusing on non-digital cards, which makes sense. This is a tabletop game symposium. I guess it's kind of implied. So now that I've kind of got across... Um, maybe a few times overboard of what I needed to do, um, uh, what or how important cards are, I'd like to go into what is a card. So like why have cards stuck around? Um, I'm going to try and outline what I understand a card to be. And I believe there's several layers or several levels that we can discuss the nature of cards. And ultimately, I'd like to use that to, to take me to my framework that I'm trying to get across today. So the first level that we might think about with uh, cards is that they're physical, the physical nature of cards. So we might conventionally think of them as components, the resources of play. Generally speaking, cards are virtually two-dimensional pieces of cardstock or heavy paper. They're predominantly rectangular, but of course there's hecatomb and, and lots of square cards in games as well. And there's information on, on one or two sides. This is, in my experience, the way that most rule books and conventions with players and designers, this is how we all conceptualize cards in games. Um, I want this to be an inclusive concept rather than an exclusive one, so I don't really, I'm not really interested in debating uh, that's a card, that's not a card. But I think that being really specific about what we mean by a card um, can sort of help us 
uh, in the future of this uh, uh, discussion. So I'd like to talk about some of the affordances that we have of this conventional card that we don't get from other card-like uh, components. So immediately we might think about corner cases like the tiles found in Carcassonne are those cards. Um, so it might be productive to think of them as such, but um, some of the physical attributes, they prevent some of the common affordances of cards. So we can't conveniently shuffle the tiles in Carcassonne. That didn't stop uh, Andreas Stedding asking you to shuffle all of the bonus tiles in, in Stauffer Dynasty. Um, that's just a tangent. Um, but yeah, so we, there's things that we can do with normal cards that we can't do with the tiles in Carcassonne. Um, what about the pieces of paper paper money that we'll, we'll see in 18xx or, or mass market games? Would those count as cards, paper money? Um, again, potentially yes, but they have a flaw of being easily damaged and then identifiable. So you can't... Uh, they're, also, they're generally quite uniform. They're used as a stand-in for a single resource. They're not going to... You're not going to shuffle up your paper money and you might get a 5 or a 7 or a 3. Um, but at the same time as, as saying that you know, some of these things are not cards. I'm also careful not to assume that some of these attributes are necessary, such as cards um, being concealed on one side and only having information on the other. Um, there's lots of examples that I'll come back to later where there's information on both sides of the card that sort of makes them identifiable <clears throat> on both sides. Um, so doing this sort of uh, uh, description of the physical attributes of cards, it helps us to justify why they're so popular. Um, cards have always been convenient to carry. They're cheap to reproduce, and they can be played in almost any circumstance. There's a quote from, from Needham, a researcher of ancient card games, that card games can be played without restriction of time, place, or weather, which I think is uh, quite noble. So um, they can and often do contain all of the required material of play. So taking um, the games of like button shy games, these uh, manufacturer of wallet games that are generally nine or 18 cards, that's the entire game. It's not the cards plus uh, other things. Um, rules for card games can often rely on, on shared conventions across games. So concepts such as the hand or the deck, um, playing a card, discarding a card, they, these are easily understood by many people of all ages, even if you don't have a background in card games. Um, and additionally, cards have some immediate attributes such as ownership. If I take a card from you or you take it from me, that creates a sort of attention or potentially an emotion in players. Um, so I could go further into those shared qualities another day, but um, yeah, just wanted to say that, that cards sort of come with a lot or they have a lot of things going for them um, in terms of being a popular game component. So let's go one level uh, deeper that uh, cards are, are not just this physical artifact, but they also have a, a cultural footprint in, in, in humanity, if I can make such a grand statement. Um, they, also, they carry some further baggage that we have to unpack. Um, so there's a book, Metaphors We Live By, written by uh, Lakoff and Johnson, and I'm very inspired by their work, um, sort of examining the metaphors that we use in everyday life. So if we look at how cards are used in everyday English, and I'll have to put up my hand and say, I've only really looked at this in English. I think it'd be interesting to look at this in other languages. But if we just look at how the word card is used in English, that sort of tells us something about uh, what we understand cards to be and, and what we understand, you know, maybe life to be through the lens of cards. So some phrases like, you have to play the cards you're dealt, which I've used to inspire um, the, this this presentation, you've been dealt a bad hand, the look of the draw. For example, these are just some idioms referring to cards. Um, and what does this say about our collective concept of cards? To borrow the analysis from Jeffrey Engelstein, um, we're apparently explaining aspects of life with the kind of input randomness provided by a deck of cards. So input randomness being that um, we you know shuffle a deck of cards, we draw a hand, and then we need to deal with what we can do with this hand. This is kind of the hallmark of the Euro game. Um, procedural generation of stories, or as I'm going to argue in this uh, presentation, the generation of interactive sub-created story worlds. So, um, but that, that said as well, so like that's just an example of, of, of how we maybe think of cards in one way in relation to life. We also use cards in 
for, with for their output randomness, which is uh, you start to tell a story and then you flip over a card to see what happens next in that story. And um, a good example of this is Composition Number One by Mark Supporto, which is a book that's been sliced up, and then you can shuffle the entire book and read the book back in a in a, a different order before and sort of create this new meaning. Um, yeah, so maybe I'm too much uh, uh, straddling between input and output randomness. That's not the most important part. I, I'm really just trying to get across that cards have some cultural baggage that everybody knows about uh, in life from those phrases I, I described earlier. Um, and then the last one then, this is the, the, the headier part, um, is the metaphorical existence of cards. So it's now productive to question the nature of cards beyond their physical manifestation. It's human nature to discretize, perceive aspects of our existence that are naturally unbounded. So some examples of this are when we try to locate a mountain. Like, where is a mountain? Are we talking about the top of the mountain? When does the mountain start? But we, we can all say, oh, there's the mountain. Um, it's kind of an unbounded thing, but we try and discretize it into being the mountain. Or uh, uh, counting street corners, for example, would be another one where we try to discretize something that, that doesn't, can't easily be counted. And so we largely understand our existence in terms of objects that we can reference, like as the examples I was just giving. Um, it's evident that the way we objectify many things in the world, so trying to combat inflation or wasting time, um, stuff like that, that's very similar to the way how we objectify entities expressed by cards. So uh, Noddy the Thief will attack your dust dust imp, dusk imp, dust imp, I'm not sure. Um, but that's an example from Keyforge. That's a phrase we might say. Um, or I will take a gift from Bolin Pass, which is a card in uh, Pax Pamir. When we enact the social contact, the contract of attaching meaning to cards in games, they occupy a quasi-duality where we think of them not only as physical cards, but as the entities we've agreed they represent. Um, so this process is called reification. And when we expose it, um, you know, when we talk about this reification, I think people will straight away disagree with me. Um, that, uh, hey John, we know the card is a card. It's just a metaphor for something else. Um, but my response would be, we don't refer to the, the card as the represented thing. We almost always refer to the card as the thing itself. So it's not merely a matter of language. Um, our, all of our conceptual processes are metaphorical, understanding and interpreting one thing in terms of another. So uh, maybe I can clear this up with an example. When we vocalize, when we're playing Magic the Gathering, um, this sort of reveals our conceptual model of the metaphor of cards. So Jace will draw me a card, or I will respond by murdering your knight in reference to the card murder. Um, we don't talk about, I'm going to play the card that says murder on it, um, and now read that card to destroy target creature. Um, maybe some people are playing magic at that level. But in my experience, we are, the card is the act of murder. This card is Jace. So I think how we talk about cards and games demonstrates how we think about cards and games. I'm not arguing that we forget that the cards are cards, and I'm certainly not to, trying to start a debate on immersion. It's my belief that there's more to just a continued suspension of disbelief for the sake of convenience taking place. We're not just calling it Jace because the card that has Jace Mirror Mace written on it is too difficult to say. And my belief is that cards sort of slip into this transcendent entity where we bind this abstract game world concept to a physical object that we can interact with. And this is like the amazing power of cards. And we're ready to accept the cards as this new thing, and we observably do so whenever we're playing with it. Um, but isn't this true of all board game components? I think this could be the case that, you know, we sort of forget that the board game components is you know, a yellow cube is food or whatever. Um, I think it might just come down to a difference in expressive power. So potentially cards are just much better at expressing these game world concepts than other things. An anecdotal example is um, if you've played Lords of Waterdeep, um, the main resources are adventurers, warriors, rogues, wizards, and clerics. And in the base game, they're, they're sort of, uh, or I think in the standard version, there are four different cubes of different colors. And the players can recruit them and dispatch them to complete quests. But I found whenever I'm playing it that we sort of forget the association um, that this is a warrior and this is a rogue. And instead, we just call them oranges, blacks, purples, and whites, um, which are the colors of the different cubes. 
this might be an oversimplification of the representation. So like if they were meeples, we might think about them differently. Um, or it might be that adventurers in the game of Lords of Waterdeep are just a commodity. But um, at any rate, I'm focusing on cards and I kind of just want to hold up cards as being an example of being very good at expressing these game world concepts. Um, all right, so <laughs> I talked about how popular cards were, maybe why they're popular. Then I talked about the different levels where we can look at cards. And, and what I'd like to talk about now is, is what are the game worlds? So what are cards evoking? And then how do I think they do that? Um, so the, the, when I was thinking about this originally, my kind of first point was listing all of the things that we could know about a game world. So the characters, the places, the weather, <laughs> the things that have happened. Um, and I sort of came back to this uh, sort of fundamental question that uh, as I was like generating these massive lists, the fundamental question to me was, are we talking about the world as it's played out in the game session? Or are we talking about the world the game is said to be set in? And we might think that these are one and the same, that the world that plays out in the game session is, you know, it takes place in the world that the game is set in. If we're playing a Star Wars game, it's set in the world of Star Wars. Um, but I think that uh, while, you know, they might be similar at some conceptual level, when we're talking about communication, we need to be very clear about what is being communicated. Is this something about the, the, the instance of this story or is this something about the world at large? What have I learned by learning this thing from the card? Um, I was very inspired by the work of Mark Wolf here. Um, he highlights nuances in how imaginary worlds um, are referenced. So there's, you know, we can call them imaginary worlds, we can call them game worlds, but the words, the words we're using uh, are actually pointing to different parts of these imaginary worlds or game worlds. So Mark Wolf offered a, a bunch of prefixes, so sub-created worlds, secondary worlds, diegetic worlds, constructed worlds, and um, uh, what Wolf's um, the the book I was inspired by by Wolf is titled Imaginary Worlds. So th these prefixes are not supposed to be interchangeable. They're all talking about different parts of the human activity of world building. For example, when we're talking about um, the diegetic world, when relating to games, we're referring to this imagined story universe. Um, so that's kind of modern narratology uh, theory. Um, and there's, yeah, a lot of different... Uh, I'm realizing I'm spending a lot of time through this, so I'm going to hurry up a little bit. Um, so as mentioned, the, uh, as I, I maybe mentioned before, the game worlds and tabletop games are interactive by nature. So they provide avenues to influence and explore the imagined worlds, making them interactive beyond the active consumption we might associate with literature and film. So game world or imaginary worlds are also created in when we watch a movie or, or read a book. And we might say that those are interactive and that we're watching them and you know trying to process what am I seeing on the screen? But the worlds that are created in tabletop games are much more participatory, in my opinion. Um, uh, Sub-creation, uh, which is another uh, concept that Wolf uh, uses a lot that's inspired by the work of Tolkien. This refers to the production and the reception of these imagined worlds. So as creators, board game designers are bringing things into being or bringing into being things in the secondary world that sort of replace or reset the default assumptions that we have of the primary world of, of real life. So for example, if a character in a game can fly, that sort of resets our assumption from our world where people generally can't just take off from the ground and fly. Um, so this is the idea of, of sub-creation needs to remind the consumer um, what, what changes in this world. Um, and so we might think that you know, a better story world is one that's very, very complete. So completeness in developing imaginary worlds is, is kind of unattainable in any medium, including board games. We can't actually go to the universe of Star Wars. We can't actually go and visit Harry Potter and Hogwarts. Um, so we can't get the complete picture of it. But world builders are sort of having a deliberate incompleteness or this illusion of completeness and that informs how the players fill in the gaps in our mental models of these imagined worlds um, um yeah so uh, 
I, I'm actually just going to move on, move on from this. I'm, I'm realizing my, my my notes are maybe a little bit jumbled when I'm talking about this topic. Um, but my conclusion from this anyway would be that uh, uh, to answer my fundamental question is that there's actually lots of things um, that game components, or if we think of it largely as games, lots of things that they can communicate. They can communicate some static elements. So these are fixed or relatively fixed facts about the imagined story universe. So we know that lightsabers exist. We know that uh, interplanetary travel is possible. Those are sort of static facts about the Star Wars universe. Um, and then dynamic elements then are referring to the actions or, or fabula, we might call it, of this instance of the imagined story universe. So if we're playing uh, X-Wing and Han Solo is flying the Millennium Falcon and Han Solo dies, did he die in that fight in the, uh, in the, the, the canon of Star Wars? Or is this game a different instance of that static uh, story world? That's what I'd really like to get out of this slide, is that there are static elements um, the sort of the facts of this imaginary world, dynamic elements, the stuff that relate to the instance that's currently taking place in our game, which we believe takes place in this static world. Then there's also ludic elements that are just stuff that we need the accounting for the game to take place. Very important in tabletop games. And then finally, there'll be some metadata about the, you know, the production of this game, the stuff that's like outside of the game and the game world that's telling us this card is first edition or, or whatever. There's lots of bits that we uh, might consider different aspects of this game world. So then uh, uh, I'm kind of landing the, the topic here now that I've sort of <laughs> loosely created some confusion or not loosely, definitively created some confusion about what a game world is. I'd like to sort of deconstruct how a card um, can communicate these four different things being static elements, dynamic elements, ludic elements, and then this metadata. Um, so when I was thinking about uh, uh, this, like trying to deconstruct what a card is, I was looking at a lot of cards from games and an approach that I took a lot of time um, when I was studying my master's in games I, was to use this object inventory for Mia Consalvo and, and Nathan Dutton and um, to grossly paraphrase what it is, is to list all of the things in the game, to choose a certain level and then list all of those, uh, all of the elements that exist at that level. So I tried to do that with cards, just trying to list if I was to hold up a card, what are all of the things on or in or around this card? And I've come down to, to three different classes of things. So the first one is the uh, physical attributes. So this is the, the literable, literal, measurable, real world properties of the card, the shape, the size, the material, the weight, um, et cetera. So um, as mentioned previously, this is often assumed for many cards as being rectangular, uniform card stock. Um, but of course, you know, these could be very different in innovations in the future or in lots of different games. We could have square cards. We could have cards made out of crackers. We could have, uh, whatever. Um, so the rectangular shape of cards informs not only the layout of information, so where we can put information on the card, but also its potential for orientation. So for example, in Magic the Gathering, you can tap a creature or put a monster in defense mode in Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, that would be visibly less significant if the card was square. So it's important that the physical attributes of a Magic card or a Yu-Gi-Oh! card is rectangular because we need to orient the card for the game. Um, yeah, to communicate different aspects of the game. Um, so the size of the card informs how much information can be reasonably packed onto both sides, uh, but yeah, onto each side. It can also code the cards into different types in a specific game. For example, uh, the oversized encounter cards compared to the miniature combat cards in size. Um, we can tell these are different classes of cards because they have different sides, sizes. Um, size also determines how many cards a player can hold in their hand. Uh, good product design requires cards to be made out of a durable material to withstand being handled. But if we made them out of a lighter material, then that could allow us to uh, permanently tear them, like we might see in Pandemic Legacy or other Legacy games. That, that serves a sort of a ludic role that it's a one-time bonus or this event can only happen one time or this is something I've already discovered. 
it can also serve a narrative role that this is an event that's only going to happen once and um, it's never going to happen again or it's a course of action that's never going to happen and um, the weight of cards combined with other factors allow for procedures such as shuffling if the cards were uh, made out of lead we would probably not be able to shuffle them or stack them or hold them in hand um, and then also the uniformity of cards allows us to conceal information that these cards you know physically look identical um, as well as the printing on the back and um, so yeah the physical attributes inform a lot of the other things that we might look at on cards or do with cards um, so then i have two other uh, um, uh, components then so we have the physical attribute and then the first of these two components is a representational component this is the set of information on a card so a study of representational components is the criticism of the quality and arrangement of the images, which will also include text, colors, icons, indices, symbols, and so on. Because of the level of abstraction, it doesn't really make sense now for me to like go through all of the different uh, representational components that we could have um, on a card. But uh, instead, I'd like to just talk about what they could communicate rather than what are, what's all the stuff you could have on a card I'd like to talk about what we can communicate with them. Um, so first of all, representational components, they're used to communicate ludic information, values, symbols that describe concepts in the context of the game's uh, system, such as mana cost, attack value, stuff like that. Um, so uh, then we can also use the information on a card to communicate um, about the static story world, so remembering that's the facts about the, the uh, imaginary world, and also about the dynamic instance of the sub-created story world. And I have this example of a um, fire breathing, a Magic the Gathering card on the left here, that I think shows both sides of this. So we see several statements in the box, um, in the, the text box on this card, um, and we know there's a contrast between the description of the buff so like there's the, the language that says enchanted creature gets plus one plus zero until the end of turn. Um, and that tells us something uh, about the game, of course, but it also tells us something about the dynamic game world that's being created because you've just given a creature the ability to breathe fire. Um, that, of course, uh, uh, that might be, that would also tells us something about the facts of this world that some creatures can breathe fire and also creatures can be given the ability to breathe fire. But fire breathing, playing that card on a creature tells us right now, Jace is able to breathe fire or whatever creature we've given this ability. Um, and then at the bottom, we can see what's referred to as flavor text. So it's a quoted joke from Pasha Ibn Asim. Um, and this tells us something about the uh, static um, elements of the game world. So just to read it out, uh, magic's only part of it, my friend. Diet does the rest. Um, and it's supposed to be a joke about fire breathing, but it tells us something about the existence of magic. Um, and also, uh, it tells us about the existence of some organization called the Suk Atta. Um, all of that's communicated just from this representational component that is the flavor text. Um, but what I think is interesting is that the this flavor text does not necessarily indicate that Peshad suddenly appeared to interject with this quip. Instead, it's more like a reference to something else that has happened um, in this uh, story world. So to this end, I think we can see the difference between there's uh, some static world elements that are communicated in this card and some dynamic elements. Um, and also we can see the metadata on this card, the illustrator, copyright information, printing rarity, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So um, to wrap up on representational components, it should be sort of self-evident how powerful they are, that they employ the can, like they're employing a lot of the conventions that, um, that still images have in painting, photography, graphic design, in film, drama, literature. There's a lot that can be naturally said with representational components. The other component, and this is the last of the uh, uh, heady concepts that I'm trying to get across this presentation. It's just examples after this. The last uh, uh, component is uh, our procedural components or procedural elements. So this is what can we do with cards? 
And this constituent is arguably the class that elevates cards from being a collection of pictures um, on a bunch of card stock to being a deck of play material. Procedural components describe the set of acts that players can enact with cards. So these could include like movements, zones, rotation, orientation, proximity, collections, such as your hand and deck. Um, I've intentionally called the procedural and representational uh, constituents, I've intentionally called them components, while the physically the physical attribute or the physical constituent is an attribute. Um, this is because we can act on procedural components and representational components, but we can't act on the physical attributes. And I think there's just a slight difference there. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just deciding how deep I want to go on this because uh, I, I think I just want to move on to examples. But um, yeah, I'll give some examples of how procedural components um, can be used to communicate aspects in game worlds. So describing ludic information, information about the game or game world dynamics, that's fairly natural. So like when we trade resources in Settlers of Catan, um, you have just gained a, a wheat and I have just lost one. Um, and it sort of tells us that in this moment, you are a Settler of Catan that has more wheat than I do or something. Um, yeah, so it tells us something about uh, the factions inhabiting the island of Catan. But considering procedural components in the light of game world statics, um, so stuff that's uh, like facts about the game world and meta information, that's somewhat problematic. So, But it's often the case, as I was saying earlier, that when we see something about the game or something about the dynamic game world, that teaches us something about the game world statics. So for example, if we had a card return from the graveyard to the battlefield in Magic the Gathering, um, that's like a miracle in the context of the game session. But it kind of signals to us that death is not final in the realm of Magic the Gathering. Um, and again, sort of resets our assumptions from the primary world to the secondary world. Um, so that was my, uh, uh, that's my framework. That's, as I said, all of the heady stuff gone. We talked about how, why cards are popular and how popular they are over such a long time. We talked about uh, game worlds. We also talked about some of the baggage that comes along with, with cards. But I've sort of given these three things, these, this new lens for looking at cards. We have physical attributes, physical components, and representational components. And now I'd like to use some examples to apply this framework to different card games. So we can see this with the tarot, and I promise to keep this extremely brief. Um, we can see this with tarot cards, that tarot cards, they don't just tell us something by the information that's on them. So it's not just the representational components that tell us uh, how to interpret these cards, but um, where these cards are placed and the order they come out in also tells us something about this uh, constructed narrative. So I know tarot cards are used for fortune telling and storytelling, procedural uh, narrative generation, but if we can think of all of those things as storytelling or communicating something about an imaginary world, um, we can see that the processes, the procedures, the things that we do with tarot cards really inform or really recontextualize the information that these tarot cards are trying to communicate. Um, in the game Dominion, um, we see at the start of the game, a bunch of cards are, are set out, and these are the different things that uh, you can purchase or with your money or influence, or there's so many versions of Dominion that I, I don't know all of the game mechanics at this stage. Um, but yeah, so the primary mechanics are involve playing cards to buy cards from this common market, and you put them into your deck um, and optimize for purchasing power. Eventually, you're going to optimize for victory points. Um, so... The game sort of establishes several zones that there's a market. So that's something that you don't have yet. And then maybe once you have it in your deck, that could be interpreted as that's now part of my uh, monarchdom. And as I'm taking five cards out of my deck, maybe that's me, you know, walking around my land and uh, uh, meeting the different characters that work for me, stuff like that. Um, but certain cards such as the militia or the witch, that allows the players to interfere with their opponent. Um, as signified by the attack text at the bottom of the card. Um, so again, that's a representational component telling us something about the game, but also telling us something about in this instance of the game world of Dominion that we're playing right now, you sent militia to attack me, or I sent a witch to curse you. 
So invoking these actions prob prompts subsequent procedures, removing cards from player's hand or shuffling curses into a player's deck. Um, and uh, again, like the curse going into your deck says that in this story, you've been cursed, but it also teaches us that curses are a thing that's possible in the world of Dominion. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, looking at the, card, the game Dominion, it generates an awful lot of data. So I think this framework is more useful when I sort of like, you know, focus in on a particular class of card from a game. So if I take Eldritch Horror, it's a cooperative adventure set in a Lovecraftian mythos where the players travel the globe, conducting investigations, fighting monsters and cultists. Um, and it really relies, I suppose, on the, the paratext of the, all the, the Lovecraftian books from H.P. Lovecraft, of course. Um, but I'd like to draw attention to the representational components that make up the asset cards. So these are things that you can buy throughout the game that sort of buff your character, allow you to overcome obstacles. So in the top left corner, we see the cost of the item that we pay for with influence. That's like an abstraction of money, I guess. Um, and you're, I guess if you're spending that influence, that's telling you something about this instance of the story. Um, yeah, and the, the name of the cards, we can see like Lucky Cigarette Case, for example. You'd still be able to use this card without, uh, without that name, Lucky Cigarette Case. But that Lucky Cigarette Case tells us that, uh, you know, potentially your character is, uh, uh, you know, absorbing a shot with their, their cigarette case. I don't know why I'm over explaining it. It's obvious what that is uh, trying to communicate. Um, so, uh, and they do this with lots of different classes of cards. They have services, trinkets, tasks, and it's interesting how they've expanded this from just being items to being a bunch of cards that can, you know, fit into different slots in the story. Um, so the designers have chosen to recontextualize various aspects of the dynamic game world using the representations of these assets. So potentially you're, you were saved by your lucky cigarette case and you use specialized training to uh, uh, acquire the Silver Twilight Ritual. I'm not fully reading what the texts are in those, those cards, if that makes sense. But you get what I mean, that all of these cards can sort of help the player uh, fill in some gaps in this story. Um, uh, taking Euphoria as another example from Stonemaier Games, um, it attempts to evoke a dark undertone of the subtitle of the game, which is Build a Better Dystopia. Players are encouraged to keep their workers as happy and as dumb as possible. And we can see this concept expressed in uh, several of the game's different cards. So there's a couple of different classes of cards in this game. First of all, the imagery and the artifact cards reminisce a sort of childlike nostalgia for a better time. Um, they're seemingly uh, toy-like and they seem to be cherished. But artifact cards in the game Euphoria are like the highest currency um, and they enable powerful benefits. So I think even uh, that role uh, um, in the game is sort of telling us something about the, the static world of Euphoria, but also when we trade balloons for, for whatever uh, uh, prestige, that's something that happens in our instance of the game. Um, and then the the uh, another uh, sort of um, another card that that leans on this build a better dystopia are these dilemma cards that you're dealt with at the start of the game, and players have to make a choice between a sort of a, a helpful helping a friend doing the right thing or exploiting a friend, as you can see in this card. Um, and there's a sort of permanence between this that once the player places a star on some place in this card, they've made a permanent choice that happens in the story of the game. But it also, again, tells us something about the larger game world that Euphoria is set in. Um, so even if the players don't feel this connection, we can ascertain that the text of the board game is trying to help us uh, establish this moment. The last game that I want to look at is Magic the Gathering, as I've been using as an example throughout uh, this presence, presentation so far. And I just have two uh, examples from Magic the Gathering. So the first one is sense making. This is when all of these um, uh, procedural and representational components are pulling in the same direction to sort of lead the player to come to their own conclusions about things that exist in the world. So you can sort of fill in the gaps correctly because of what you've seen on these cards. 
So uh, this is an example I've, I've shown to a lot of people before, I think, that uh, if we take one card, which is Dark Steel Ingot, that is an indestructible card that, uh, uh, yeah, it can be used to add mana of any color to your mana pool. We'll just forget about that for now. But um, uh, the important thing here is that Dark Steel in Ingot is indestructible. Uh, the second card then is Marauder's Axe. It's an equipment that we can equip to a creature, and it gives that creature a, bus of pl a buff of plus two, plus zero. So n seeing these two cards, and if I told you a third card existed called Dark Steel Axe, you already know what that card does. That is uh, an indestructible axe that gives the creature plus two, plus zero, and it can be equipped. And of course, it's uh, uh, completely broken when you compare it in cost to the other two, uh, um, the other two cards. But um, yeah, so this is an example. Maybe it's a bit obvious, but this sort of sense making is maybe a little bit rewarding to players when they see this happen in your games. They're like, "Oh, that makes sense. That's consistent. That has you know filled in the gaps exactly as I would have filled them in if I believed that such an artifact existed." These are the properties that I would have given to it. Um, and I think when we try to use these components in the, the right way together, that we can land on some of these moments. Maybe an example that leans more on the uh, procedural components is the evolution of double-faced cards in Magic the Gathering. As I alluded to before, uh, or maybe when we traditionally think about Magic cards, we think that they're all uniform. They all have the same you know, Magic the, Gather Magic the Gathering back. Um, but in 2011, with the Innistrad block, Magic started to print information on both sides. So both sides of this card could be played. You couldn't choose at that time which side of the card would get played, but you'd play one side, and then eventually it would turn from one to the other. So Innistrad was all heavily influenced by vampires and werewolves, and so this is an example of a werewolf card. We have uh, a little Red Riding Hood type that... Um, Maybe because uh, spells being cast include or is a proxy for the passing of time, or because she's allergic to magic or something, she will turn into a werewolf. And we can see that she can turn back as well. If we compare that to Chosen of Markov. Um, you can tap another untapped vampire you control, which is a procedure that uh, could be interpreted as okay, this vampire is busy uh, biting the Chosen of Markov in the neck. Uh, to turn um, this human into a vampire. Um, and that makes us flip over the card. But interestingly, we can't flip the card back later. So the difference in procedure between the Scorned Villager and Chosen of Markov is showing us uh, how innovative we can be with storytelling of the dynamic story, but also the static story that vampires can never change back, but werewolves can. Um, yeah, it's sort of communicating all of these things just by a change in the in the procedure. Um, the last one then is how these double face cards are being used nowadays in Magic the Gathering is to sort of represent um, an entity and then an artifact that's associated with that entity. And if anybody's keeping up to date with Magic the Gathering nowadays, there's loads of examples of double face cards and so many ways that they're, they're being creative, telling stories with both sides of, of one card. So yeah, Turgrid, God of Fright, is an entity that could appear in your game, but some creature, or rather, you could also make use of uh, Turgrid's Lantern, which has some association and effects, but also tells us that Turgrid is not going to show up because she's on the other side of the card. So maybe the spirit of Turgrid is in this card. Again, it's open for interpretation. So uh, uh, to sort of conclude this uh, very uh, long-winded presentation, which I hope uh, uh, people got something out of, um, why do I think that this sort of work is important and uh, not just, uh, uh, I don't know, academic <laughs> uh, steam? Um, I think it allows us to do textual analysis of card games, even though my examples here have just been sort of, you know, uh, an introduction into how we can apply this framework. Um, it, we could use it to analyze games going forward and also games from the past. Um, what is this game trying to tell us about its game world or does it have some other message? How does it do that through the cards? Um, also, it allows us to check what does innovation look like? So is printing new flavor text on cards innovative? It is. It's innovative writing, I guess. But is it innovative, innovative from a card game perspective? Maybe not. Or maybe those innovations are just slightly different. Um, but having a framework like this allows us to sort of assess 
innovation in card games. Um, as well, I think if we apply it to a lot of games or if we apply it to our own work, um, we can see that we have sort of design conventions or a certain bias that, oh, if I want to communicate that, I'll just change the picture on the card or something. Um, and maybe it allows us to escape these biases in the future. Um, and then finally, it allows us to reflect on maybe our, our design methods and our design sensibilities. So the key takeaway is that cards are old, that they're an overlooked form of expression. They're weird. And what I've tried to offer is a new way of thinking about this ubiquitous game component. Um, I think I learned a lot from several dis disciplines, game studies, narratology, anthropology, visual design, interaction design. And um, I think that my presentation tries to like create a language in a space where this language doesn't currently exist. I think when we think about card games currently, we're thinking about the card as a sort of homogenous element. Or maybe we're being very creative, but we just don't have the language to talk about it. So um, yeah, that's my own assessment of my work. And uh, thanks for your interest in tuning in. Um, I'm sure I probably lost some people along the way. Uh, I, and forgive me for relying on my notes a lot. It's been a, a, a long week. I just finished up lecturing with my, my students today over Zoom. <laughs> but uh, we got there in the end. If you'd like to catch up with me or talk about this, you can ask some questions now. I know we have uh, people that can facilitate that. Or I'm always available on, on, on Twitter or most recently on Twitch to talk about games or, or play games. Thanks very much. The void. <laughs> I don't know what's supposed to happen next. Um. I don't know if uh, somebody's supposed to get in contact with me or uh, what am I supposed to do? Maybe I was talking into the void for <laughs> 53 minutes. <laughs> Hello? Nope, John, we hear you. Um, okay, cool. Something's happening on Mickey's side. We have a question from the audience that is... Oh, great! They, they would... <laughs> no, you've had an engaged audience. There's a conversation happening. Oh, good. Okay. I'm confused <laughs> what I'm sure, the, but okay. Sorry for the vague panic. Okay, the no question problem. we have is, can you talk a little bit about your reaction to the idea that when people come into a game, their prior knowledge of the game game world, the universe that the game happens in, influences their expectations. So stormtroopers are bad guys, but some card games have elements that have been made up just for that universe. And they're kind of just wanting you to riff on that and talk about what comes to mind there. For sure, yeah. I think um, uh, one thing I've realized in, uh, I guess, studying games at large is that all of this meaning making, the what is a game, what is the game to different people, that's always constructed on the player side. So, um, of course, players are always going to come with uh, some sort of what, what I would refer to as paratext, some stuff that's outside the text of the game um, that sort of informs their understanding of that game world. But of course, people just come from different backgrounds anyway. So we might have a predisposition to, you know, uh, um, believing that certain cards are good or, or certain cards are bad, certain entities in these game worlds are good and bad, just based on our prior experience. So I think this is kind of unavoidable. And at the end of the day, uh, we shouldn't be trying to, you know, we might have an intended meaning that we would like the players to get out of the game. Um, but at the end of the day, we're just creating invitations that sort of invite the players to uh, um, to feel or interpret the game in a certain way. So I think it's a, a little bit unavoidable, I guess. And, and sometimes you get those canon clashes, especially I could imagine in like fan-made uh, games where, oh, this doesn't make sense. Uh, Han Solo would never do that. I don't know why I keep referring to Star Wars. That's like the <laughs> uh, the the whatever fantasy universe I'm probably worst versed in. Um, 
but yeah, I think it's 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 unavoidable, and we're just trying to you know invite the players to reset their expectations in the context of the game. Okay, that looks like the one question that we had. So okay, cool. would you like to tell everybody where to find you on social media? And then I would also like to invite people to join us over on the Discord if they want to continue the conversation off screen. For sure, yeah, and I'll go there. So, um, yeah, you can catch me at, uh, at Jano Avocado um, on Twitter. Uh, here's a beautiful avocado that my sister made for me recently. <laughs> uh, I'm just obsessed with that food. Anyway, uh, you can catch me, Jano Avocado, on Twitter or Twitch. Um, always available to, to chat about things. I'm also Jano, Ava, Jano Avocado on Discord. And I'll go to the Discord right now and be happy to uh, talk about card games or hopefully get rid of some of the confusion that I might have just created. <laughs> Thanks.